When Professor Hamdi asked me that, uh, will I consider coming and uh, sharing my thoughts on a particular topic in urology, I felt really very humbled. Uh, coming to Oxford and talking about uh, uh, basic science uh, was a special treat for me. And uh, I was lucky enough yesterday to sit through the entire session which was going on and uh, um, thinking about a surgeon talking about how to merge in the clinical expertise with the, the opportunity to think critical questions. That was the thought which I had about five years ago and uh, that was the time when actually one of your uh, stars here, PS, was with me. So I was an established surgeon who was dabbling with uh, different research ideas. Uh, I got uh, in connection with some scientists who were really very exceptional in the prostate cancer field. Uh, Dr. Rubin was there and uh, my uh, pathologist Brian Robinson was there and uh, we got plugged into with the Dana-Farber group and Barod Institute and uh, then through some of my uh, research, I got plugged into Prostate Cancer Foundation, which is uh, run by uh, Howard Sewell and um, uh, Jonathan Simons and Milkins Group. So I started thinking about that I cannot be a real prostate cancer doctor. I was not thinking about as a surgeon. Doctor who can make a difference for the patients if I only know one tool, and that is the surgery. So I was traveling uh, somewhere and uh, I uh, had a access to a book through internet, uh, one of the basic sciences books, looking at uh, genomics and I slowly started thinking about what can I do and the first step was uh, that I wanted to start in a very comprehensive biobanking protocol there, which was a little tricky in the beginning with uh, um, robotics because uh, Robotic surgery is you take the prostate out, you leave the prostate in the body, you finish the lymph nodes, you finish the anastomosis and then take everything out. So there is a significant time in which a disconnected ischemic organ is sitting inside the body and that is the time when the RNA degradation happens inside the body. So we had to figure out a way that we can take the prostate out and still be useful for uh, molecular studies. So we tweaked certain things and then we started getting it and we got uh, a very robust program and uh, um, in biobanking uh, tissue and uh, different other body fluids and so so this is my journey about having no background other than had, having had a studies in pathology and um, basic uh, through the medical school as a surgeon to establishing a lab which now is functioning and we have three to four PhDs so everything which I am presenting is 90% done by others and 10% by me in terms of coming up with the ideas and putting the program together. Right at the outset, I'll also give uh, my disclaimers. I don't have any in terms of, I don't have any industrial collaborations, anything. If I give a talk to the surgeons, then my intuitive collaborations, they start becoming relevant. But here, I have been funded with Prostate Cancer Foundation. I have had a ROWIN grant through NCI. I just submitted a couple through the Department of Defense, some private foundations funding the studies, but no industry collaborations, nothing of that kind, which is relevant to what I'm talking. I do run now a program in precision urology, in precision in terms of individualized to an individual's genome, and how can we tweak and provide care which is relevant to a particular individual. As uh, I say, I have a, a lab and uh, three people I must mention, uh, uh, Dr. Yadav, Dr. Singh and uh, Dr. Nair, these are three PhDs in the department right now. I'm a PhD advisor to another person who is doing a PhD at uh, Mount Sinai and uh, there's another one coming from France and doing a PhD under me and Arnold Winners. So, then I have collaborated a lot with the Cold Spring Harbor and uh, in uh, Mind Sinai there are different other scientists who are real scientists who are helping me in establishing the program.
I know this room has a, a lot more people who are not necessarily the urologists, and that's a good part of it because uh, I have learned more from an other collaborative fields than just talking to my colleagues in urology. And prostate cancer is what my interest in, and um, it's a very unique disease. Prostate cancer is like uh, three different kinds of cancers clumped in into one common pool, prostate cancer. Most of the prostate cancers are like just very cute cubs, what we call a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. Then we have some which look scary, may be scary, may not be scary. These are the Gleason 7 cancers. Hidden amongst those pool are the real man-eaters, and uh, these are Gleason 8s and 9s and 10s and some 7, 4 plus 3 kind. But as a pool, we get about 280,000 of these cancers every year. These 280,000, they look all cancer, patient gets a diagnosis of cancer and they get scared and then the journey starts and they need to figure out within a very short span what needs to be done. And even as a surgeon or a clinician, I'm not 100% sure as to what to advise to a particular patient because just having a diagnosis of prostate cancer doesn't give me what's going to happen in terms of biology to these patients. So that was one of the questions that initially I thought that I was over-treating the patients, meaning uh, patients who could have been a good candidate for active surveillance were being offered radical prostatectomy. Um, as the Professor Hamdi said, I have now uh, performed about 6,000 of these surgeries, and uh, uh, I often go back and look at it. And uh, um, in 20, uh, so 2009, uh, I had a, a dinner with someone I respect a lot, uh, Peter Scardino. Peter Scardino is the chair of uh, surgery and urology at uh, Memorial, and uh, that was about my fifth year in uh, New York City as a surgeon, and I uh, often used to sit down with him, and then he said, Ash, you're doing a great job, everything is fine you may want to think about uh, putting more patients on active surveillance. This was an honest discussion in uh, uh, Pentaluma was the restaurant in the evening and we sat down. I said, I'll look into it. And I went and looked into my entire cohort of radicals I had done that time. About 27% of my patients' radical prostatectomy path showed that they had a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. So that, uh, that was actually a very good number. Because uh, when I looked at the other institutions, uh, that range was anywhere between 20 to 60 percent of them. I had 27 percent of my patients, uh, even after the radical, uh, they had a Gleason 6 prostate cancer. And I started deliberately working on it. How can I minimize number of patients who are Gleason 6? As of last, uh, 2014, my number was 10 percent. So, um, and then most of these 10% are very young people or a high volume Gleason 6 or prostates which are extremely big that because of the voiding issues, I had to do something. So that was the journey. I, I had to differentiate between the good guys and the bad guys with what was available. I will not talk about any stream which I took, which involves imaging. So I, I, I thought I will take in a satellite view of uh, uh, prostate and see if something is visible and that is a good sign for uh, aggressiveness. So I invested a lot on an imaging program. So we have a multi-parametric MRI imaging group, which is quite busy. Uh, and we have experts looking at different imaging parameters. And the other side, I wanted to go deep dive into the cellular level and the molecular level and understand if that combination can give us. Today's discussion is about the molecular side of it. I'm trying to combine them together with the infusion technology in which we possibly can have a better understanding of radio genomics, but today it's all genomics. Three different kinds of cancers, we don't know who is going to do what, and that was the challenge, and this was the driver. I needed to do something different, even though I was doing a good job in terms of survival and the quality of life for the patients, they were patients I was losing, this is a actual cell in my list, it's in the crosswire for me, and a wanted list. This pathology is from a patient I couldn't win. This is Gleason 9 and 10 patient who actually died. 
So this is the cell which finally escaped in spite of us doing everything, all combination of radiation to surgery to hormones and every other kind of treatment which was available. So this slide is my driver that we haven't yet achieved what we want to achieve to get the cure in most patients. We get it many, but it can be improved on. But I also wanted to avoid surgery in many who didn't need the treatment. So this will give you a perspective as to what is happening inside the prostate. Prostate is an organ right in the pelvis. You get inside the prostate and you find and suddenly one cell becomes renegade, starts devoiding, and this is Gleason 6 up to this point. Once it breaks through the glandular wall and it starts growing into the stroma, it becomes a pattern 4 or Gleason 7. Then it's become Gleason 8 and then finally it comes close to this surface of the gland and finds a blood vessel or a nerve to get outside the prostate. And that is when it becomes a really incurable prostate cancer or a cancer which is more invasive and it goes into the nerves and from there it can go to the lymph nodes, it can go into the brain, into the bones and different places. So the cancer which is up to Gleason 7 is a totally different animal versus the cancer which grows, becomes invasive, doesn't respect the normal boundaries of the body and becomes a metastatic cancer. I thought that finding a difference between those two was an important question for us. So I started, and that was a time when the genomic was being talked about a lot. I think the cover of uh, the whole, cancer, whole genome was sequenced and then uh, Time Magazine had the whole article on that and uh, we had some collaborators who were very interested in the genomic. So for me to understand the genomic is the first goal and I'm going to talk about it. Talking to a group of scientists in Oxford, talking about the foundations of genomic, it looks silly, but I'll go through exactly the way I went through. So for me to understand genomic was as if I have two instruction manuals from my parents, one from my mother and one from my father. Each one of this instruction manual has 23 chapters and these are 23 chromosomes. Sorry, I'm simplifying it down to a urologist level. So, so bear with me, but uh, these 23 chapters have 23 chromosomes and each chapter, there are different paragraphs describing a particular skill, particular way of doing things. And these are different genes. One talks about how to make a soup, another talks about how to run away when you see a predator. There are different things written in the, each one of them. And these are written with an alphabet, that is DNA, arranged as in words and sentences, and finally a paragraph. So each paragraph is a gene. We focus on these paragraphs a lot without understanding that these gaps between the paragraphs, these are the introns where we don't know what's happening. There may be a lot happening at that side also. But this was my simplified version, so these are the chromosomes. I'll come onto the chromosome as to what is going on. But understanding what is happening inside these genes and these genes are being transcribed. This book was to be read by us and then followed. But let's first understand our genome a little bit more. In the multicellular organism, we have up to two meters of DNA, one diploid cell. When you multiply with the number of cells, we have enough DNA to go from here to sun and come back 300 times. Each one of us have enough DNA if we unfold it that we can go there. And this all is packaged in a particular way. So just understanding the DNA a little bit was important for me that at the simplistic level, chromatin is a double standard helical DNA. It is complex with the histone in forms of nucleosomes. They turn around, they get packaged, they do things, and ultimately 300 nanometer fibers are compressed and folded to produce 205 nanometer white fiber. And then finally, this is all coiled together, that a length of from here to sun 300 times is packed inside of a body. Each one of us carrying that much of a DNA inside of a body. Understanding this DNA was the key for us, and there are many methods of deciphering this. So understanding DNA was important and how to study that was important. And uh, as you can see, we can do a whole genome sequencing or we can do an exome sequencing, only those part of which are being transcribed. We can look at the message which has come out and it can be RNA sequencing or we can do a microRNA sequencing, a small RNA sequencing. 
we can do a chip sequencing in which we can look at the nucleosome maps and the chromatin proteins, how things are getting organized inside. We can do actually epigenomic study and this all can be done using a next generation sequencing. But I'll take it to the next level that this multicellular organ may have multiple cells getting sequenced and now we are dabbling with what we call a single cell sequencing. So this is a little bit background of the technology, the different terms will come, the mutational profile, the spectrums, the mutational rate, methylation rate, pathway analysis, structural variations, copy number variations, these are the different ways of looking at what's happening at the DNA level. What is mutation is that that book which we had had some problems, the typewriter is here and sometimes you can see certain alphabets in the typewriter are actually not working very well or they're jammed together. They were supposed to say salt and they somehow transcribe sugar. So instead of putting salt in the sugar, we start putting sugar. So that was the background, a fundamental for me to understand. And then second thing to understand is what's happening inside a cancer cell. And again, this is a fundamental for a basic scientist, but for me to understand what's happening at the cellular level in cancer, and this is a classical hallmarks of cancers in which there are hallmarks, there are enabling hallmarks, and there are new characteristics which are being talked about it. I simplify things. So for me, in a cancer cell, it's like imagine yourself driving on the roads and suddenly you find that your car accelerator is stuck. You take the foot off the paddle and still car is going very fast. That essentially means that you have, in you have in something going on that is not stopping and that's an oncogene in terms of the cancer biology. That basically sustained proliferative signaling is what we call. Second thing is that you stop the process and you take, apply the brakes and the car should stop. There are those kind of genes which are known as tumor suppressor genes and those genes are also not working in a cancer cell. Once you think that, okay, you brakes are not working, accelerator is stuck, sooner or later you will run out of gas, meaning the, this, the, this message of keep going, what we call the telomerase length, which normally cells stop, will stop at some point. It doesn't happen in a cancer cell either. It learns how to avoid the immune mechanism, it learns how to rig the car so that the carburetor works better, the Warburg effect in which the metabolism is better handled. Combination of these things make the cell become a malignant cell. And up to this point, I'm okay. Till this car gets off the main highway and gets into an all-terrain vehicle mode. And that's where the epithelial to mesenchymal transformation happens. And I heard that there was a talk yesterday which talks about a normal epithelial cell, well-organized cell, is now mobile and it gets into the invasion mode and then now the bad things are happening. So this entire process is happening at a cellular level and I needed to understand. So how, how do I translate that into the, this hallmarks of cancer into prostate cancer? And uh, there are books written about uh, what are the different pathways? I had to learn certain new terms. So this is a normal cell with the mitochondria and the gene. So one was, which we call it, that constitutive proliferation was happening because of certain receptors and then IGF was one of them, P10, RAS and uh, AKT pathway was one of them. And that was driving the proliferation process. Then, the Warburg effect is being talked about that the mitochondria can bypass unnecessary steps and just handle the calorie intake and the oxygen intake into giving enough energy to cells to divide. That was the second thing which was happening. They figure out how to not go through the apoptotic process and as you can see, certs were the main mediator for that. IGF-1 and other mechanism were giving them in power to overcome senescence. It somehow interacts with the inflammation also, which is one of the newer one we are talking about, how inflammation interacts with the cancer and sometimes gives us a power to become more invasive or even start cancer. We have to know about the, how the cells, they are evading the immune mechanism and how the tall, right, tall like uh, receptors are involved in that process how cells are bringing in more vascularity to get out of the cell or get more nourishments and that's where the 
VGF and the angiogenesis is coming into play, and ultimately how the tissue invasion is happening at, and metastasis is happening. So all those features, hallmarks of cancer, they can be turned into what is causing each one of them. So I had to learn a little bit about these fundamentals there. And then this all was happening at a genomic level. And then in prostate cancer, androgen receptor is involved. And uh, that is a known fact that if there is no androgen, unlikely that the cancer happens. But sooner or later, cancer cells, they figure out how to overcome androgen necessity and they become castrate resistant cancers. So, and it works through many of these uh, pathways. So that was the foundation for me. When you look at the cancer cell, you start from a normal cell to high grade pin, to an indolent cancer, to an aggressive cancer, and to invasive. My question was those cubs, toothless tiger, and the man eater, what differentiate between them? And based on review of the data on different publications, you can see certain names, patterns start emerging. The P10 and uh, uh, different uh, inflammatory markers and NF-kappa Bs and uh, uh, MAP kinase and all those names, they start coming into the picture. But these are different genes which have been implicated at the different stages, one stage to the other, what's happening. If you look through, the, so, so I was covering about what are the different pathways which are involved in the cancer. This is a recent paper which came out in Cell which talks about the integrative clinical genomics of advanced prostate cancer. The important thing here is, in prostate cancers, which are the bad guys, 71% of them, they have something to do with the androgen receptor pathway. 49% of them have something to do with the PI3 kinase pathway. 21% of them have something to do with the cell cycle issues. 18% of them have WNT went pathway and 13% have a DNA repair. And this is important. This is the BRCA1 and BRCA2 discussion which goes on for the breast cancer. So based on this discussion, uh, a, a scientist group in Mount Sinai and my group have joined hands together and we call Fathers to Daughters and Mothers to Son program in which we are talking about synergy between the breast cancer and prostate cancer, what we can learn from each other, and also extend the family history studies involving the breast cancer and the ovarian cancer. And I've had few patients uh, who were treated as a male breast cancer early on, and I have treated them for prostate cancer later on, about 10, 15 years later. So we are studying in there. And I must say that the breast cancer among the solid tumor has taught us most in terms of learning about the biology and the molecular pathways. So this is the recent summary of what is happening. The good part of it is, is this key term here. That 90% of these are still actionable molecular alterations. I don't think we have developed anything for more than 10, 15% of them. But 90% has a potential of having something which can be done which will be a targeted therapy. So I will not go through this. There are many, many studies which have been done, which talk about different studies about what is happening, what's the oncogene, different copy number variations. And, but if someone is interested, I can share this. We just wrote a review article on this thing. So while I was developing the cancer uh, biobanking program, we published a lot, and uh, Levi Gare and Garvey and Mark Rubin, they were the main mentors in this. They were the senior author. I was just part of that. We did some exome sequencing to come up with, uh, Chris was, uh, Chris Barbary was uh, my resident there. And he's in uh, MD, PhD, and he came up with this POP, which is now considered to be one of in common mutations which is being seen, not necessarily the most uh, aggressive cancer one, but it is in common mutation which is being seen. Then we started looking at uh, small RNAs. So, my simplistic way of understanding the small RNA discussion was that DNA is the boss, RNA is the pen to write something, and small RNA is the cap on that pen. And there are two kinds of pen. One is an oncogenic pen, and other is a tumor suppressor pen. Based on which micro RNA is missing or presence in abundance, you can or cannot write that instruction to do the good thing or bad thing. 
So this small microRNA discussion is coming, and I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, who is working on the small RNAs, uh, microRNAs here. So that, I think that's another area we can explore it. We did some of the studies. I was very, uh, uh, ha I was lucky to be part of this one, and this was done with the Levi Garavis group, punctuated evolution of the prostate cancer genome. We normally thought that uh, it's a sequential accumulation of the mutations of whatever genetic changes which are happening, which cause prostate cancer, and then it makes it become more aggressive. They came up with a term, which was known as chromotripsy and chromoplexy. Something is happening, something bad is happening in terms of the nearby environment that the chromosome is getting shattered. And after it is shattered, the body tries to put it back together. And it gets put together in a wrong way that the nose is attached where the ear should be and ear is attached where nose should be. It is okay, other than looking bad, it is not bad, till the oncogenic structure comes very close to something which is very relevant and that is what's happening. So they came up with a term which is known as, instead of gradually happening, one, two, three, four, this is in catastrophe where things die. Punctuated ev evolution of the cancer is happening, and in prostate cancer, this may be one of the mechanism why you had some bad things happening, 10, 20% inherited through a germline, remaining happening through the exposure in our body. One step was crossed, and then things were stable, and something else happened, and it got really malignant. So that may be the, one of the ways things are happening, and these were all, um, most of them were my patients who were studied. We had to make things complex. Things were going very well, and uh, we were studying uh, the genomics, and a lot of good papers were coming out, but uh, this was the first paper, actually. These were uh, seven of my patients, which were sequenced by um, Marx group. And uh, as you can see, these are the seven patients, and I know each one of them. There were different kinds, at least in nine to seven and eights. And um, these were the circograms, and uh, uh, this is looking at deletion, insurgence, and the different DNA profiles in the, each one of them. They look pretty uh, different here, but you can look into one thing which came out very obvious, that not only that they are morphologically different, at the genomic level, these cancers are very different. And look at this one, I will give you an example. If someone wants to see how many bad things are happening in this one, this one, this one doesn't look that bad, but he still had a T3A cancer. This one only had a T2C cancer. And guess what, T3B is this, and this is T2C. So you can see there was no real correlation as to what was happening in cancer, just looking at the DNA profile. And bottom line was each one of them was different, and that is what we call intertumor heterogeneity. Between the two tumors, there was a heterogeneity. But then concept came from Swanton's group looking at the kidney cancer, that even in one cancer, while we say it's in one cancer, there are multiple mutations happening, and then he gave an example of a tree. Look at a certain things have to happen before a tree will get out of the ground. But in order for the branching to happen, some other additional mutations need to happen, and that's the branching. So he found, looking at the kidney cancer in the kidney and in the body where it has metastasized, there were different genomic alterations which were happening, which is obvious to the scientists here, what we call a clonal evolution or an intratumor heterogeneity. Within a one tumor, there are different areas which are different. And people have talked about, at least in prostate cancer, trunk drivers, the ERG, and uh, SPOP and all those things, and the branch drivers are the P10 and the androgen receptor amplification. We can keep talking to a next paper which came out just here, this year. And this is something which is relevant to what PS is doing in an oligometastatic protocol, in which if you study a 10 metastatic lethal cancers and look at the different areas where the cancer is, you will find there are different clones. And you can track them down which clone is causing the trouble or mischief now based on the genomic sequencing of the one area versus other area. And many a times you see the one area becomes the dominant one. And to a point that sometimes it seeds back into the main prostate if it is still intact. 
the patients in whom cancer prostate has not been removed. Sometimes cancer can get back into the own area and at least there is in one example here. And you look through this, this is a brilliant paper looking at different clonal evolutions. So bottom line is cancer cells, they evolve in one own patient. One, one patient itself, it's evolving and there are different clones which are evolving. They visualize them as in colony of cells, some really bad guys and most of them just the cancer guys who are doing things for the bad guys. So you, look, you keep looking into that and there are a lot of papers which are coming out that uh, it is important to factor in and study intratumor heterogeneity because unlike common wisdom, at least in this paper came out in 13, that the bad guys came from in Gleason 3 primary disease rather than the bad, considered bad, visually bad area, which is the primary grade 4 meaning these metastases came out from an area which was not that bad to a pathologist. We grew patients into Gleason 6 and 7s. This came out from an area which was not considered bad, but the bad thing which happened into the bones and the liver and the lymph nodes and the lungs, which happened from that area, they could track it down. So we really need to understand a lot about the intratumor heterogeneity. And cancer, as I said, is not in one cell which is there. When you look at the cancer microenvironment, there are cancer cells and there are body's own cells which are now producing a new colony of cells. There are macrophages, there are bone marrow, bone marrow derived cells, there are local cells, vessels and everything combined. And we call that as a tumor, very, very generic, gross way of looking at it. And when I take a prostate biopsy, this is the actual needle of the prostate biopsy. This is the actual amount of tissue which comes out. And this is actually smaller than a rice grain, by the way. Length may be a little longer, but the thickness is smaller than a rice grain. And when you look at it, there are about million cells in the tissue which I take out even in an prostate biopsy. And if you look through this, most of this is not bad. This all is a normal cell. The bad guy is only here. And if I take a soup out of these million cells and only five cells were the bad guys and we put them together and do a genomic analysis and average everything, I'm not sure if I'm studying what's happening which is driving the disease. If I get the worker's bee and miss the queen's bee, I'm not going to understand the real cancer biology. And that is what we call the bulk sequencing. When we are doing the sequencing today, we take we make sure that there is 80% of his cancer cell from the area where it came out and that 80% is analyzed by the sequencing technologies and that bulk sequencing is an average of a lot of cells which may or may not be even cancer. So I got pulled towards another group in Cold Spring Harbor, Mike Wigler's group, who was playing with the single cell genomics. And Bottom line is they did it for the breast cancer. We started doing it for the prostate cancer. They can bring down the sequencing and whole genome amplification to a point that they can look at genome at a single cell level. We are doing it. We have done many patients. We are working on a manuscript. So this allows us in one patient to look at different areas of the prostate cancer and see what clonal evolution is happening. So I started doing this. This is a radical prostatectomy specimen. This is the exact biology. I will draw in every patient where the aggressive cancer is, where it is escaping, where the lymph nodes are, and making one cancer into six cancers. Pathologist will sit down. He will mark exactly the area where there is a cancer from each one of them. I will take the tissue and we will develop libraries. So this is one of the Gleason 9 cancers. This is what we call different clones of cells which have evolved. And in the one patient, and this is looking at the sectors at the benign sectors or in pin or a invasive into the vesicle, deeper cancer and in the capsule. These are the sectors. This is the ploidy. These are the different chromosomes. And these are different clones. And as you can see, there are areas where there's nothing major happening and there are areas where there's a major catastrophe is going on. And as you can see, the red is a gain and the blue is a loss. So this is a copy number variation assessment 
in one patient in a different areas, and you can find how the biology is progressing in one particular cancer, which is mapped to the anatomy and spatially. You can also look at this intertumor heterogeneity looking at the single cell genomics over time also. If you're doing a single cell genomics, and we have just started doing that program in an active surveillance patient, you can do a targeted biopsy from a particular area over six years. What happens to that patient? Same area, reasonably close to where we are taking the tissue from and how things are evolving, we can look into that. So the first round was only doing a copy number variation. As you can see, we can study, we have a viewer made by the Coil Spring Harbor Group and we can evaluate. For a simplistic way again, for a urologist, it's easy for me to see the right side picture is a bad guy and the left side is a Gleason 6. So since it's at a single cell level, I don't have to do a major biopsy and just take some of the cells out. And now we are looking at its utility in urine. So if I can get the single cells into the urine, hopefully we will be able to find some signatures of the bad guys right in the beginning, which will tell me that even though this looks like a Gleason 7 cancer, it has some cells which are bad guys, we should have a closer eye on this case. So we have used this approach to help me in differentiating those toothless tigers from the bad guys. The next few slides are basically a summary of it. A whole talk can be given on this. There are different commercially available and very boutique markers which are available to differentiate between the good guys and the bad guys. The oncotype DX is one. Cell cycle progression is the one. Then CNV copy number variation based clusters, four gene signatures, a 32 gene uh, RNA expression signature. They are there, they are doing a good job, but we have to account for the tumor multifocality, heterogeneity, long natural history sampling, and they should be able to really differentiate between indolent and aggressive disease, not just based on the pathology, but on the biological behavior over time. P-tail is coming to be an important marker. There are many discoveries that are happening through Polaris and deciphers and other markers. This is an extensive list. I'm not going to go through all of that, but people are interested in this area. But my interest was not only just to develop something to better help me in differentiating, but also possibly a targeted therapy. So one of my PhDs, Dr. Yado, is working on taking the prostate tissue, working a cell line in an organoid, working in an animal model, giving and exposing different models with the different drugs, and then seeing which one works, and then finding a treatment protocol which is individualized to one particular patient. It has just been launched in the last one year. We are very early in that process, but this is an individualized therapy program. And the last thing which we were working on is the personalized vaccines. So we just got the IRB approved in patients within Gleason 9 and possibly at T3A and T3B cancers. We are going to give, we'll extract the tissue, we will do the sequencing, we'll expose them to poly ICAC. We will re-inject back into the prostate, we'll give them intramuscular, we'll wait for 12 weeks, we will take the prostate out, we will study the tissue, and we hope that this will give them a better biochemical free survival rates. This is in first study which we are launching. These are the different steps to that, that we take the poly ICLC here, we take the tissue out, we re-inject it back, and uh, then we see how it do, and we have the whole tissue. So, based on what I have been doing, if I go back 27,000, 2700 years ago, this is one institution where I can talk about 2,700 years, kind of a number because we are used to, a, this institution is in such an old institution, you can relate with this. So this is the first ever diagnosed patient with prostate cancer. I cannot talk in America because 200 years is a big number there. But here in this place, I can. So this is the first ever patient officially diagnosed with prostate cancer. He was known as the king of Arzan and uh, somewhere in Siberia, somewhere in Pashto areas in uh, Afghanistan, he was there. He died because of prostate cancer and this is what happened to his bones. 
And this is the first ever described mummy known as M1. And this is about 500 years old, who was diagnosed with prostate cancer. And I think they have confirmed it based on uh, uh, genomics that they, he truly, they truly had prostate cancer. So if this person was to be diagnosed today, he would have had an imaging done using an MRI. He would have had a targeted biopsy done to do the whole genome sequencing. He would have had a cell line developed and a mouse model developed 50 miles from his own residence so in which his cancer will be nurtured and grown. This is, that's the way it thinks should evolve. Someone in the lab would have been trying to develop different medications, see which one works. This patient, if was found to have a more aggressive cancer, would have had his prostate out, developed a personalized vaccine, and then, like modern patients today, more than 95% of our patients, they live. So this is the vision which we have, that genomics understanding will help us in developing a program which will ultimately, A, reduce the number of biopsies which we are making, two, do biopsies in a minimal number of targets so that we can avoid unnecessary biopsies in the different zones. It will give us more confidence with who is a good candidate for active surveillance. When I do do the surgery, I will do everything possible to minimize the cancer coming back. And if cancer comes back, this genomic will help me in developing a more personalized targeted therapy program and a more personalized vaccine program. And ultimately, it will be a gift from grandfathers to the grandsons that a particular genomic of that family can help in developing a strategy which is personalized follow-up strategy for the next generation. This has been my learning <clears throat> process and I wanted to share that in a nutshell. Thank you very much.